In this video, we will take a first look at limits, which are an important part of calculus. We will start by understanding what a limit is, and look at three examples of different types of limit. We will then look at an informal definition of limits, and follow that up with a formal definition. Finally, we will look at some simple examples of cases where a limit does not exist. This graph shows the function f of x equals x squared. If we wish to find f of x for any particular value of x, we can simply find the value of x squared. For example, f of 2 is equal to 2 squared, which of course is 4. We can illustrate this on the graph. We draw a vertical line from the x-axis where x equals 2. That line crosses the function curve where y equals 4. Now let's imagine we aren't allowed to calculate f of x for the value 2. We are allowed to calculate the function for any other value, just not 2. But even with this restriction, we can still find something out about the value of f of 2. We can't calculate f of 2 directly, but we can calculate f for a value of x that is very close to 2. For example, when x is 1, f of x is 1. When x is 1.5, f of x is 2.25. When x is 1.9, f of x is 3.61. Each time x gets closer to 2, f of x gets closer to 4. When x is 1.99, f of x gets even closer to 4. When x is 1.999, it gets closer still. We can repeat this from the other direction, using values of x that are greater than 2. When x is 3, y is 9. When x is 2.5, y is 6.25. When x is 2.1, y is 4.41. If we use x values of 2.01 and 2.001, y gets even closer to 4. Of course, we don't need to stop there. We could keep going using x values to get ever closer to 2, without actually reaching 2. We call this a limit. We say that the limit of x squared as x approaches 2 is 4. This is written using this notation. Now we will look at a slightly more interesting function that will help us understand the usefulness of limits. We will use the function x over x. At first glance you might think that we can simply cancel the two x's, leaving a simple function f of x equals 1. And that is almost true. But there is a problem when x is 0. The function value is then 0 divided by 0, which of course is undefined. This is shown on the graph by a small circle with a hole in it, this indicates that the function has a gap at zero. We call this gap a discontinuity. The function is defined everywhere except the one point where x is exactly zero. The gap in the function is infinitesimally small, but the gap still exists. So f of x is 1 wherever x is not zero, but it is undefined at x equals zero. In the previous example, we had a condition that we were not allowed to calculate the value of x squared when x is 2. But this time there's a very good reason why we can't calculate the value of the function when x is 0. The function doesn't have a value when x is 0. But we can still find the limit at 0, and we can find it in the same way. When x is minus 1, the value of the function is 1. When x is minus 0.5, the value is 1. When x is minus 0.1, the value is 1, and so on. As we approach 0 from the left, the value is always 1. This remains true no matter how close we get to 0 provided we don't actually reach 0. Similarly, when x is plus 1, the value is 1. When x is plus 0.5, the value is 1. When x is plus 0.1, the value is 1. And the same is true for even smaller values. So the limit of x over x, as x approaches 0, is 1, even though the value of the function at x equals 0 is undefined. This is useful to know because it tells us how the function behaves as x approaches 0. It is very important to realise that we are not saying that 0 divided by 0 is equal to 1. All we are saying is that the limit of this particular function as x approaches 0 is 1. To illustrate this, consider the function 0 divided by x. This function has a value of 0 for every non-value of x, but again it is undefined when x is 0. As you might guess, the value of this function as x approaches 0 is 0. This is exactly why 0 over 0 is undefined. It can only be defined as a limit, 
and that limit can take different values depending on the situation. There is another situation we sometimes encounter, that is where a function has both a value and a limit at some point, but they are not equal. A simple example of this is the piecewise function shown here. A piecewise function consists of two or more different functions that each apply to different intervals over x. In this case, f of x takes the value of x plus 1 for any value of x except 2. When x is 2, the function takes the value 1. The graph shows this. The straight line is the function y equals x plus 1. But this has a hole at the point 2, 3, indicating that the straight line function doesn't apply at that point. The red dot at the point 2, 1 indicates that the function takes the value 1 when x is 2. We can find the limit at x equals 2 in the same way as before. If we start with a value that is less than 2, and then get closer and closer to 2, but without reaching 2, the value of f of x will get closer and closer to 3. If we start with a value that is greater than 2, and then get closer and closer to 2 but without reaching 2, the value of f of x will also get closer and closer to 3. So the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 is 3, but the value of f of 2 is 1. So let's summarise the three situations we have met so far. A function might have a limit at a particular point that is equal to the value of the function at that point, or it might have a limit at a point but the function itself is undefined at that point, or it might have a limit at a point but the function has a different value at that point. So now we are going to define exactly what we mean by a limit. We will start with an informal definition and then a more formal definition later. We have looked at some specific examples of limits, so first let's generalise that. We will use some function f of x that has a limit of l as x approaches the value a. This is written like this. So far we have said that as x approaches a, the value of f of x tends towards the value of l. We will now make a stronger statement. If a limit l exists at a, we can make f of x as close as we want to l, simply by making x sufficiently close to a. In our x squared example, f of x has a limit of 4 when x approaches 2. So in that case, l is 4 and a is 2. The definition of a limit means that we can make f of x as close to 4 as we wish, provided we choose a value of x that is close enough to 2. Let's test that. Say we would like f of x to be in the range 4 plus or minus 2. That is, f of x must be between 2 and 6. We can shade this region. In order for f of x to be in that range, x must be within the shaded area. The range of permitted values of x is roughly between 1.4 and 2.5. We don't need to find the exact boundaries. We just need to stay within those boundaries. It is clear from the graph that if x is within the range 2 plus or minus 0.4, then f of x will be within the range 4 plus or minus 2, which is what we want. The yellow lines show these values. What if we wanted f of x to be within the range 4 plus or minus 1? We just need to shrink the area. This time we require x to be within the range of approximately 1.7 to 2.3. Again, staying within these boundaries, we can say that if x is in the range 2 plus or minus 0.2, then f of x will definitely be in the range 4 plus or minus 1. Now let's say we want f of x to be within the range of l plus or minus epsilon, where epsilon is some small number. Then we will be able to choose some other small value delta, such that if x is within the range of a plus or minus delta, then f of x will be in the range of l plus or minus epsilon. This will always be true, even if epsilon is very small provided it is not quite zero. However small epsilon might be, we will always be able to choose a very small value of delta such that f of x is in the range l plus or minus epsilon. We say that l is the limit of the function f as x approaches a. The reason this is true in this case is because the function x squared is a fairly ordinary well-behaved function. In a moment we will look at some other functions that aren't quite as well behaved, and where this condition is not always true. Some of those functions don't have a limit at certain places. Here is the formal definition of a limit. For a function f of x, we say that the limit of f of x as x approaches a is l, 
if for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that the modulus of f of x minus l is less than epsilon, whenever the modulus of x minus a is greater than zero and less than delta. Let's unpack that. Remember that the modulus of v is the absolute value of v. For example, the modulus of 5 is 5, and the modulus of minus 5 is also 5. So when we say that the modulus of f of x minus l is less than epsilon, we are saying that f of x is somewhere between l minus epsilon and l plus epsilon. Similarly, saying that the modulus of x minus a is less than delta means that x is somewhere between a minus delta and a plus delta. But we also specify that delta cannot be zero because then x will be equal to a, which is not permitted for a limit. What this definition tells us is that if the limit l exists, then no matter how small epsilon is, f of x will be within a distance epsilon of l if x is within a distance delta of a, provided delta is small enough. This definition also tells us that if the condition is not true, then there is no limit l. We'll look at that situation next. As a very simple example of a situation where a limit does not exist, consider the square root function. What is the limit of this function as x approaches minus 1? Well, since we are only dealing with real numbers, the square root of minus 1 is undefined. In fact, the square root of any negative number is undefined, so we can't even find the square root of a number that is close to minus 1. So we say that no limit exists for the square root function as x approaches minus 1. What about the limit of the square root function as x approaches 0? This might look a little more promising, because we can calculate the square root of 0. We can also calculate the square root of a small positive value of x. And we can see that as x approaches from the right, f of x approaches 0. However, the limit definition requires that for the limit to be 0 as x approaches 0, then when x is in the range minus delta to plus delta, f of x must also be close to 0 but the square root is undefined for negative values, so f of minus delta doesn't exist. Therefore, no limit exists at zero. However, as we approach zero from the right, that is for small positive x, it behaves a bit like a limit. We call this the right limit. Sometimes, if we are only interested in the limit when x is small and positive, we can treat the right limit as if it was a normal limit. Here's the function x divided by modulus x. This function is similar to x over x, but there's an important difference. The denominator is the modulus of x, so it is always positive. This means that when x is less than zero, the numerator is negative, but the denominator is positive. They both have the same magnitude, so the function value is minus one. When x is positive, both values are positive and the same magnitude, so the value is plus one. And of course, when x is 0, the value is undefined. If we start with a small positive value of x, f of x will be 1. As x approaches 0, the value of f of x remains at 1. As we saw earlier, this is called the right limit. If we start with a small negative value of x, f of x will be minus 1. As we approach 0, the value of f of x remains at minus 1. We call this the left limit. This function has both a left limit and a right limit at 0 but the two limits are not equal, so no overall limit exists at zero. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. You can also join my Substack mailing list. This video is part of a series covering calculus, and I also have a book available. The links are in the description below.